Allons enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest installment of Real History. For this episode, what we are going to be doing is examining George Clooney's 2014 World War II adventure comedy, I think some could say, The Monuments Men. And for this episode, we are joined by a special friend of both Andy and I and many of our reenacting colleagues. This is our friend Theo from France who is a World War II historian himself and he will be offering some global perspective on this film. So Theo, thank you for joining us. Thank you. This film is loosely based off of the exploits of the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives section that was part of the Allied forces in 1943 and onward. It ultimately comprised some 400 individuals from 13 different Allied nations whose sole mission was to go out and obtain artistic and cultural artifacts of significance that the Nazis have stolen. So how does the Monuments Men do in regard to the historical record? Where could it have perhaps done a little bit better? Where are things condensed? Those are the things that Theo and I are going to be discussing. All right, let's go ahead and get started with the Monuments Men. So the art that we are introduced to here at the outset of the film, uh, which is in many ways key to the film's plot, is the Ghent altarpiece, uh, which a very iconic piece of religious iconography uh, that was completed in 1432. Uh, Theo, why don't you start off by telling our viewers where you're from? Are, are you near Ghent at all? Have you uh, seen any of these sorts of things? Yeah, I live actually at maybe 40 minutes on the road to Guyon, near the Belgian border. So I'm, I, I already seen this, this city, this beautiful city, yeah, uh, and this cathedral. On, but it's something uh, strange because I never seen the Rotable, sadly. Well, maybe you will someday. <laughs> yeah, with you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So our story then shifts gears to one of the art museums in Paris. And Theo, can you you have been to this place? Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. this place? What it is? Several times. Uh, it took place in in French, Le Jeu de Pomme. It's uh, a building built in late 19th century in 1861, if I remember well, and it's in the Jardin des Tuileries. Champagne. So if I remember correctly, this museum is essentially right next door to the Louvre. It's yeah. very nearby? Yes, so it was. And so the, the Jeux de Pomme was essentially a holding area for a lot of the artwork that was being collected by the Nazis. So somebody like Hermann Goering could come and take his pick of the collection. Yeah, he came several times at Le Jeu de Pomme. We are also introduced to the character of Rose Valland, uh, who, uh, her name is Claire in the film, uh, but she is a composite character based off of this real life personality who was to play a really fundamental role in the exploits of the, the monument section. Uh, and so we're going to be introducing some of her exploits uh, a, a little bit later on. And right after that, uh, we see uh, Da Vinci's The Last Supper. And the film takes us to Italy. Uh, and this is really the only little bit of Italy that we get a sense of mm -hmm. in this film. Uh, most of the movie takes place in France and in Germany. but. It kind of shows us the international problem that the Allies are facing and how they're going to possibly try to save all this art. This is in February. 
This is Monte Cassino in March after we dropped 20 tons of explosives on it. So in the slideshow that George Clooney's character is showing to President Roosevelt, we see images of Monte Cassino being bombed. And Monte Cassino was this old, centuries-old abbey uh, that had been obliterated by American air power in May of 1944. And prior to this place being attacked by American troops on their way to Rome, uh, Hermann Goering's troops had emptied something like a hundred truckloads of uh, precious artwork and sculpture out of it. Uh, and then thereafter, as I said, it was completely annihilated by Allied air power in the effort to try to dislodge the German troops who were using it as a fortification. And so um, here, right from the outset of the film, that historic site becomes one of the martyrs, the rallying cause. But in actuality, uh, the monument section had been established the year prior. There was already this very big recognition that there was some sort of cultural intervention that was needed. Uh, and so uh, things are very much condensed and amalgamated here uh, for the sake of carrying the, the narrative forward, uh, but it works for the presentation for the audience's sake. Handy, il fait vraiment trop chaud, mais l'air conditionné, s'il te plaît, je meurs. C'est une Michelangelo joke to be made. You're just the man to make it. You're hungry? You buying? Uncle Sam is. Oh, from the outset, we really get a sense of these disparate characters coming together, these unlikely combatants. Their average age was 40, although some of them had military experience prior to all of this, and we'll get into the biographies of some of those individuals a little bit later on. Uh, but let's just say they were perhaps not physically up to par with the 20-something recruits that they often found themselves working with. The, the part with John Goodman putting on his uniform, I, that's what I kind of felt like after the pandemic, putting my reenactor gear back on. That's what I felt like looking into the mirror. We have your architect from Chicago, Sergeant Richard Campbell, and we have a Frenchman, Lieutenant Jean-Claude Clément. You can see in the movie a French actor, Jean Dujardin, but sadly, he's not, uh, he's not very accurate. Uh, he interprets an English historian, if I remember well, and this this historian is not an, a real a, a real man of the monuments men. Mm -hmm. So he's not really based on anybody yeah. in particular, like the American and the British characters yes. in the film. So perhaps this movie, like Dunkirk, maybe the French don't get their due to the extent that they should. As always. <laughs> As always. Okay, all right, those are fighting words. Is Preston here? Private Preston Savage. Private? That's not going to sit very well with him. It doesn't. This is me at the range last week. <laughs> you know, as a French, uh, I never shoot in my life. We don't have the rights in France, or we need to have a license. And so, last week I shot for the first time of my life. And you can see in this movie, it's the first for a lot of the monuments men too, and that's quite funny because I recognize I recognize me into this man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. <laughs> so you got to fire a carbine. Yeah. And an M1 rifle. <laughs> for yeah, the, the first time last week, so. A, a little bit of connection here with our characters. This photograph has been obtained by the OSS. It's a model of his planned Führer Museum to be built in his hometown of Linz in Austria. One of the major projects of Adolf Hitler was to build a Führer Museum in Linz, where he was born. And so he and his fellow Germans stole all the artworks and paintings all over Europe just to put this in this museum. 
and the museum never it was never constructed. It never came into being, but it was always a dream of Hitler's, uh, one that he clung to until the very end of the war, as, as this movie later on suggests. Do you find this uh, to be an accurate representation of the Normandy beaches? You've been to Normandy many times. You travel there many yeah. times a year. Does this look no. the part? I, I was in Utah Beach two weeks ago, you know, and indeed it looks like mostly a Ma beach, uh, one of the two American landing beach for the day. And I think one, and Andy just made the, the really good observation. Um, in some ways, Geographically speaking, this beach scene looks a little bit more like what Saving Private Ryan uh, should have looked like. The one problem with this scene, though, is that the beach is not busy enough. Uh, they're landing here. They're kind of the only people there. You get a sense of all the scale of the operations. There's ships. There's barrage balloons in the background. But this was a major point of entry for the European theater of operations. There were daily thousands of people coming through here. And so there should have been a lot more people uh, just milling about and walking across like we see in these subsequent camp scenes. Why didn't you tell me he fought for the resistance? He doesn't. He doesn't now. He was shot this morning. In many ways, this is a a rather sad scene with Claire Simone's character because she's informed that her brother, who was involved in the resistance, was captured and executed. Uh, and so these were the daily dangers that members of the resistance found themselves in. And I'm wondering if you might be able to tell us a little bit about your family connection with the resistance during the war. Yeah, um, I'm lucky enough because I have all my family archives and I found that my great-grandfather served in both World Wars and then just after being discharged in 1940, he served in the French Resistance uh, until the end of the war. What sort of work was he doing with the Resistance? <laughs> he, he was a former policeman, so he had some access that a lot of people didn't have. So uh, I don't know, I don't, we don't know what mm -hmm. job he did, but I'm pretty sure he did a great job. But there's a, a, a wonderful photograph that you have of him yeah, we can with, show with all of uh, his, his, his fellow resistance yeah. fighters, which we'll be sure to show. On the movie, the filmmakers um, told us that Rose Vallon have a brother and Maybe, but it's no, no, no one knows very well about this brother. So maybe she had one, but it's something maybe inaccurate a little bit. You speak English? Yes, I speak English. Okay. So how bad is Matt Damon's French? Indeed, he has an horrible accent. <laughs> But he speaks French, so it's not too bad. He speaks more French than I do. So. Maybe. When I kittle sehe, wünsche ich ihm ganz bestimmt das Beste von Ihnen. Herr Hoffmann. The character of Sam Epstein is based upon the real life personality of Harry Etlinger. Uh, who was a German-born GI who served a very valuable capacity as a translator. And in real life, as well as later in the film, uh, he gets a little bit of uh, retribution and justice uh, that's, that's very fitting to the film's plot that we'll be discussing more in depth. Uh, but he was one of the last Monuments Men uh, to be living. Ellinger passed away in, in 2015, uh, and with him we see that the passing of this generation of, of the Monuments Men. Uh, and so 
Uh, this movie came out the year prior, and in many ways I'm glad that he got to see this being depicted on the big screen, even if the film is comprised of a lot of different composite characters and plots. Hey fellas, look what we found. As we find ourselves in saint Lô, France, uh, this is one of the communities several dozen miles beyond the Normandy beachheads. And this was a community that just witnessed complete and utter devastation. Uh, me and Andy and several members of our reenacting group, the Furious Fourth, have, have walked these streets and there are uh, still bits of evidence of the destruction that took place there nearly 80 years ago. Uh, one of the really evocative parts of the fighting around St. Lo, uh, a photograph comes to mind uh, and it shows the, the remains, the corpse of Major Thomas Howey, uh, who was a battalion commander in the 116th Regiment. And after he was killed in action, his men placed his remains in front of the rubble of the cathedral in San Lo. And this spoke not only of the sort of affection that his men had for him, uh, but it also speaks to the sort of historical buildings that are being destroyed, including this really beautiful cathedral in San Lo. Uh, and so I, I think uh, that's an interesting historical footnote to keep in mind as we look at these recreated scenes of destruction. So now we know it's not random. Systematic. Every single one of those paintings is a masterpiece. What can you tell us about San Lo and your various journeys there and what all you've seen? Today, San Lo is a very different city than the one you, all grandparents know. Uh, I have several friends who can testify about that. Uh, the city is totally new, you know. As Jared said, you can sometimes see remains of the war on the wall and... There's, an, there's an old jail there, yeah. the, the, the archway, the, the partially destroyed jail um, that I remember, but... Yeah, you, you're right. Yeah, like, like you said, it's... Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of cities in France that are new cities, you know, I think saint Lo and Le Havre and these places that were just so destroyed during yeah. the war. These were historical, um, not historical, but very important places for both Germans and Allied during the war for the, for the progression of the troops, you know. I have a boy, a 17-year-old boy. He's, um, he's with the resistance up in the north. As we get into this next scene with <laughs> Matt Damon's character and the composer <laughs> mm -hmm. of the film, there's more talk about the resistance. And interestingly enough, the resistance fighter says that his 17-year-old son is in the north of France fighting. He doesn't know what's happening to him. And Matt Damon says it's rough up there rough in the north of France. Since you are from the north of France, can you tell us what were some of the challenges that the French people and maybe your family members or ancestors were having here at this time? North of France is a very industrial region in France, very important in, in the heart of Europe, between France, Belgium, Germany. Uh, there's a lot of roads and so this region is very uh, strategic for everyone and the resistance in the north of France is not just destroying or killing Germans it's a lot of informations uh, they, yeah, they, they, they send information to, to the Allies because this place is so important that you can destroy it like, like everything uh, before so mm -hmm. No, allies definitely need the north in a good shape to advance in Belgium and then in Germany. You like to fly? 
the the French resistance fighter who is driving Matt Damon in the wagon is the film's composer, mm-hmm. Alexandre Duplat. Okay. And so he, he gets a little bit of an acting role here. Uh, and so just a, a nice little bit of, of film trivia as well. How much of the art did you save? The national collection is safe, but the private collections, they are all gone. What happened to all the art in the Louvre at the beginning of the war? Um, all the paintings and statues were sent at the um, Chambord Castle, or in French, Le Château de Chambord, in September 1st, 1939. So a lot of the artwork had already been taken out of Paris. Yep. And, you know. uh, just uh, until the day that the German invaded the south of France and then stole the, the art and paints. All the private Jewish collectors by decree are illegitimate. Going use this place to shop and take them where? Germany, to their homes. What was it like living in Paris during the occupation? What, what sorts of stories have you heard about French people, French people that perhaps you talked to who were living there at the time, what, what were the sorts of things they were going through? Living in Paris is it's not like living outside big cities, you know. Uh, they lived with a lot of restrictions. They didn't eat enough. They didn't find uh, classes as they wanted to. So living in the 40s in Paris or in other big cities, you know, was something very complicated and especially when you were a child too because my grandma was living in Lille uh, when she was young and she told me several times that she's still um, hearing you know the bombardiers flewing so people uh, still hunted but by what they lived and flew. The US Army would like to help you get them back I'm happy to hear you say that. Where do we start? Claire Simon. Damon's character is based off of a real-life ar- army officer by the name of James Rorimer, who was a Harvard-educated scholar. Uh, he had an expertise in uh, medieval art. He worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And uh, he really becomes one of the, the influential and supremely important monuments men, particularly regarding his association with Rose Valland, because it is their communication and their ultimate building of trust and the emergence of all of these log books that were tracking the location and the transportation of these various pieces of artwork that allowed the allies and the monuments section to track so much of this down. Vous avez que j'aimerais à vie. J'en sais rien. Can you stop speaking in French? So, as we see in this scene, Rose Valland, her character therein, here in the film, was actually imprisoned for a short time as a collaborationist because she did speak German, she interacted with German officers, but a lot of people did not know a lot of the secretive work that she was doing behind the scenes. Why were so many people like Voland thrown into jail? Why did they end up there? So, those who were sent to jail was for collaborationism. And, you know, in jails in France, just after the liberation of Paris in August 1944, you can find both women's and men's. And there is an episode in the French history that we are not very proud today. Uh, the women, especially the, the women, who had worked with the Germans and the Vichy government, were shaved in the streets and yeah, beat something like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. And so, the for for some of our viewers that might not be familiar, the the Vichy government was the puppet government. Yeah, for Nazi Germany, the, the collaborationists that, mm-hmm. that you referenced. Uh, and so they suspected her of being 
this because of the different associations that she had with the Germans. So Sam, when did you leave Germany? 1938. Yeah, I was 13. Did your family go with you? And I think one of the really telling conversations between the character of Sam Epstein and Frank Stokes is this conversation about how he was kicked out of his town of Karlsruhe in Germany because of his Jewish faith and he never got to see the Rembrandt painting that was in his neighborhood. And uh, this is taken directly from Harry Etlinger's uh, own biography. Uh, and so this is a moment where uh, reality is being mirrored here in the film. And of course, we're gonna circle back to that in a really profound way later on. Yes, uh, we flew Germany just after this bar mitzvah in 1938, I think so. Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. And then six years later, he ends up back in Germany yeah. wearing an American uniform. Yeah, and, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And he wasn't the only one. He doesn't speak any English. Not a word. You're just gonna sit down? Yeah, I think, why, why don't we all just sit down for a sec? Okay. I think this interaction with the German prisoner is one of Bill Murray's better scenes mm -hmm. in the film. Are, are the French fans of Bill Murray? No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> blasphemy. Well, he hasn't seen Groundhog Day, folks. Um, he just saw Groundhog for the first time a few days ago. And so we're going to introduce him to Groundhog Day and introduce him to a whole other level of Bill Murray appreciation. Yeah. So fair enough? Yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> You're just going to sit down? Yeah, I think, why, why don't we all just sit down for a sec? I just want to say, like, there is maybe French who know Bill Murray, but I personally didn't know who he is. It, so. It's okay, we forgive you. We <laughs> forgive you. John Wayne. John Wayne. Bill Murray's so chill. I love it. So I, I really like that they mentioned John Wayne. It's like the one thing that they can communicate on because there's a fun little bit of trivia here. George Stout, who was one of the head monuments men, was born in the same hometown as John Wayne. So there's a fun connection for you. Right. Okay, I'll take him out. I'll take him out. You have a family. So do you. With these uh, combat scenes unfolding, and John Goodman and Jean Desjardins are bickering back and forth, I, I, I heard in an interview that John Goodman, the actor here, um, he was so happy with these scenes because he had never been in a war movie before. And during his whole time as an actor, when he was a young actor especially, he wanted to be in a war movie. And so, you know, here he is in his 50s, finally you know living out a dream and you know getting to to shoot at nazis uh in a movie so uh, he definitely had had fun with this i suspect <laughs> well <laughs> that's me well he <laughs> that's you <Yeah. laughs> with the carbine <laughs> well i mean you are a beginner just like he is so i think it's okay I find this scene with the young German shooter is a little bit inaccurate because really you don't see German kids fighting until they actually get into Germany. Mm -hmm. They're still in France here yeah. at this time. Um, and so... Maybe they're just doing it to make it comedic or a little bit ironic, but it, it doesn't quite make sense, historically speaking. Are you a Catholic, Lieutenant? I am tonight. Dear Father. Now, the character of Don Jeffries is based off of a real-life British officer by the name of Ronald Balfour. And Balfour... He was killed by an explosive in 1945. He didn't quite die as a chivalrous a death uh, here at, at the foot of the Bruges Madonna. 
Uh, but uh, there's certainly some poetic license being taken here, and perhaps it's somewhat cornball. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. You can see her porcelain hand gently holding the small boy as if to guard him from a fate she knew would come. What is the city of Bruges like? Bruges is called the Venice of the North because you can find a lot of canals. There's a lot of water in, in these cities. She's a very nice city. Mm -hmm. If you have the opportunity to go to Bruges, go. Mm -hmm. So lot, go. lots of canals. Yeah. Or like even an old uh, architectural type, like the one we can you can find in the 17th century. Now she's a well-preserved city. M E R K E R S Burger. Got it. Any work for Granger? Nothing yet. The uniforms in this movie, it seems to me, they could be a lot, lot worse. Yeah. You know, they're, 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 they're pretty good. No, they're good, yeah. Yeah, all things considered. Now, one of the other really interesting things is that George Clooney's character, the real-life person, whose name was George Stout, he was actually a member of the United States Navy. And if you look at the original Monuments Men photos... He has the blue band around his helmet, like men in the Navy wore, and he sometimes had USN stenciled onto his jacket. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that this movie ignores, is the fact that some of the Monuments men were actually members of the United States Navy, as well as the United States Army. Nearly 350 soldiers, men and women, served in the Monuments men. So they're from Plenty, plenty units. Some mm -hmm. from the air corps, maybe. Some from the marines. Uh, some from the infantry. Yeah, and some of the organizations that honor this this unit uh, actually call it the Monuments Men and Women now. <laughs> yeah, um, because indeed there are a lot of women uh, who who served in the Monuments section too. Troubles will be out of sight. Some critics found this Christmas montage uh, a little bit too sappy and a little bit too sentimental, but there is a degree of, of truth uh, in some of these scenes, uh, especially with that of the Christmas music being sent on the, the vinyl record. And uh, to speak to this a little bit, I'm going to read just a really brief portion of the inspiration for this movie, Robert Edsel's book of the same title and in real life Bill Murray's character is uh, based off of an individual by the name of Robert Posey who was uh, uh, an excellent architect from White Plains New York and uh, this is what Edsel has to say about this moment during the Battle of the Bulge. Robert Posey couldn't wait he had intended to keep the last Christmas present in the shipment from his wife, Alice, the big one marked with love from your family until Christmas Day. But he had waited six days, and it was only December 16th, and of course that is around the same time that the Ardennes Offensive commences. He simply couldn't wait any longer, so he ripped open the box and dug eagerly down into the packing material. Eventually, his fingertips touched the cold plastic. He lifted the present out of the box. It was a phonograph record. The greatest surprise of all, he wrote, Alice later that night, was the record letter at Christmas greeting. I immediately raced over to the special services company where the sergeant put on one of those radio Victrola hookups, and I sat in another room and heard it come over the radio. It is the finest present one could have. Your voices were perfect. Even the off-the-record instruction you gave Dennis to say anything you want came over without a syllable dropped. And so sometimes, indeed, it is these simple gifts which are most meaningful. And this wonderful little Christmas episode that we have in The Monuments Men is, in fact, based in fact. And that's straight from the book. <laughs> Sergeant, the Germans, the 
Дайте им немножко хлеба. One of the other things that really intrigues me about this scene is that there's some German prisoners sitting off to the side and the Russian officers like, treat them well, make sure you feed them. It's like they didn't want to go full villain on the Russians, but we all know how poorly German prisoners were treated if they were captured by yeah. the Russians only, during the war. Yeah, only a few of them came home maybe 10 years after the end of the war. It's called the Nero Decree. What? It says if Hitler dies, they're to destroy bridges, train tracks, archives, art. So we now learn about the Nero Decree, and what that dictated was that essentially what the Germans couldn't save or salvage or keep out of Allied hands was to be destroyed. And we even see Hitler signing it with the model for his Fuhrer Museum in Linz right behind him. And so he still has these delusions of grandeur to the very mm -hmm. end. And you can have a proof with his volunteer to destroy Paris uh, just before the liberation by Fourth ID and the French troops uh, at the end of August 1944. And there is another movie that talks about the potential burning of Paris before it is liberated. Would you, and you, you really like that one. Yeah. Yeah, so tell, tell our viewers a little bit more about that. Next time you're in the United States, maybe we'll look at that yeah, movie. Maybe in a year. Uh, it's called Paris Brutile in French. It's it. Paris burning yeah. in English. It's about yeah, the liberation of the city of the capital of France uh, in under 24, 25 August 1944. As I told you, by the French uh, liberation forces and the Fourth ID. So maybe we'll have an episode about it. Yeah, that would be awesome. And it's it's kind of a hidden gem. It, it's this epic war film that really nobody has seen. It was made in the mid 1960s. Yeah. Right after the Longest Day. And it tried to use a lot of the same techniques and narrative formula as The Longest Day because it shows all sides of the perspective. It shows the French, it shows the Germans, it shows the Americans as Paris is about to be liberated. And so it's a really interesting film and it brings up this question, if Paris is destroyed, what art and culture will be destroyed with it? And so it's a really good companion piece to The Monuments Men that we encourage you to, to check out. I have a nephew who studied art in Paris. Yeah, he, he, he lives a few miles from here. He may be able to help you. Huh? Is he a soldier? <laughs> so this scene with the dentist, it, it seems like another ridiculous made up incident, but once again, this too is grounded in reality because Monuments Man Robert Posey had been suffering from a toothache and a dentist was a very hard thing to find at the forefront of the Allied advance going into 1945. And so he had to travel some 200 miles to find a dentist. And fellow Monuments Man Lincoln Kirstein, um, who was a famous uh, Broadway writer and ballet instructor in New York City, uh, was traveling with him and indeed these two guys they found a dentist and uh, once again uh, Robert Edsel <laughs> offers us the the true story and the inspiration uh, for this film and Edsel says of this moment the dentist an older man spoke fine heavily accented English and gabbled more than a barber as one of them said he seemed to know everything and everyone in Trier and he seemed as interested in the Monuments Men mission to save German culture as he was in fixing poor Posey's impacted wisdom tooth. You might talk to my son-in-law, he said, putting away his tolls at the end of the procedure and wiping the blood from his hands. He's an art scholar and he knows France. He was there during the occupation. He paused. But he lives miles from here, I'm afraid. I can only take you there if you have a car. And indeed, in an encounter somewhat similar to what we see here in the film, it leads the Monuments Men on a breadcrumb trail that ends in a big reward with a huge cache of art. Uh, and so, once again, some of the more seemingly fantastical elements of this film are in fact truthful. Look at him. It's a beauty. He's a runner. Hey, my friend. How do you feel about Jean Desjardins' portrayal in this movie? 
I left John Dijon Ahmed. Maybe not his uniform. <laughs> he doesn't carry himself well in uniform? No. You don't think? Oh, okay. Do you think that his character is maybe oversimplified? Is he a token character? Yeah, yeah. He don't have a, a big place in the movie. Um, yeah, he's been killed very quickly in the movie, so no. And as we said, he's really the only main character who's not based on somebody, and so it's, it's kind of an obligatory nod in a way. I find this combat scene really frustrating because it had so much potential. This movie doesn't really, despite it being a war movie, it doesn't really have a big battle scene in it. And this scene could have been it. But instead, it's some half-assed tactical scenario where for some reason, the Americans leave their entrenched, covered, concealed position to run out in the open which they never would have done. Uh, and it, it's just stupid. Uh, it could have been something really good and compelling and a powerful moment leading to the demise of one of the main characters and instead it's just kind of hokey. What do you yeah. think? No, I feel you're right. It's especially in Germany, where the Germans fought for the land. So no one runs in a field like that in front of Germans. Yeah, well said. I think a really good way to handle this scene would have been, you still could have included the horse, you still could have had the French soldier being shot. Uh, I think what would have worked better is if John Goodman had pulled his comrade to the American trenches, the foxholes that were right there, and he could have been trying to take care of him as the battle unfolded around them. I think that would have been a lot more realistic a scenario of stolen art buried in a German copper mine. It seems the Nazis took better care of paintings than they did people. There's a lot of speeches in this movie. <laughs> it kind of drips with self-importance, which I think is the reason why a lot of critics uh, really dislike this movie. What do you think? Yeah, but that, that's not too bad because a lot of military movies are just fighting battles. And this one depicts... Um, a, a new a new type of movie, you know, maybe more cultural with, yeah, the fact that we are speaking about art, paintings, and no one heard about the Monuments Men before this movie, so mm -hmm. it's why this movie yeah, is image. Yeah, I think that's fair, and I think the audience is being constantly reminded of why these men are doing what they're doing. And I think in the context that you just stated, that makes a lot of sense. Mine in the town of Merkers. Enclosed are your transfer orders. We'll need you here as we've lost both Jeffries and Jean-Claude. The, or another factor that I think a lot of film critics overlooked. In my mind, what director George Clooney was trying to do with this film is that he was trying to recreate some of the big ensemble cast war epics of the 1960s that perhaps he grew up watching. And I think when filmmakers try to recreate that old Hollywood style, that critics are very cynical of it and those sorts of connections fly right over their head because in my mind, I think most film critics don't actually know film or Hollywood history uh, that well, especially this genre. Uh, and so, in my mind, I think a lot of film critics were perhaps overly harsh on this film. I, I really enjoy it, and I know you do too. Yeah. Yeah. This is my address. You bring the potted meat. I'll bring the wine. The historical record would suggest that Rose Vallon had a female romantic interest and perhaps uh, would not be as... Uh, it's much in pursuit of Matt Damon's character as, as the film might suggest. Uh, so a little bit of uh, romantic embellishment here to add some chemistry between the characters. This is every piece of art that came through the Jour de Pont. No, I have kept train manifest uh, receipts. So Theo, perhaps you can talk about the importance of 
the ledger books, the log books that she is giving to him in these scenes because uh, this sort of transaction mm -hmm. did occur. What exactly were these? Why were they important to the, the mission of the Monuments Men? So, Rose Vallon, during the full war between 1940 and 1944, worked at uh, Le Jeu de Pomme with Germans. And inside the building, there was plenty of paintings and sculptures that were stolen by Germans to put in private collection, like the one of Adolf Hitler or Hermann Göring. And Rose Vallon takes note of everything from the name of the, the painting, um, where she came from, and where she's going to. So she, she helped a, lo a lot, the Monuments Man, because, yeah, it's like, you know, it's, it's a book. He, mm -hmm. All the information were on the end of the Monuments Man. That's a very important factor in, in the history. It might not have been possible without her. Yeah, or maybe more complicated. Mm, much so. So the, the level of gold discovered here uh, is certainly no exaggeration. Uh, and uh, there's, there's plenty of photographs uh, showing all of this. And as is described in the books of the Monuments Men, hidden inside the Merker salt mine was the majority of Nazi Germany's gold reserves and paper currency. All but the largest paintings from the Kaiser Friedrich Museum in Berlin were also placed there for safekeeping. In today's dollars, the value of the gold found in Merkers would be almost $5 billion. And this was also the ideal place to store artwork because in a way it was climate controlled. It was a salt mine and therefore there was no, there was less saturation, there was less humidity. It was a perfect place to store these masterworks of European art. Uh, and indeed, that is where they found a lot of these really prized items, including the Rembrandt uh, that Harry Etlinger had always desired to see as a young man. The Army may not care much about art, but they sure should care about gold. One other thing that I'll add too. Uh, where John Goodman says that the generals uh, don't give shit about art, but they care a lot about gold. Um, I, I think that's a little bit unfair, perhaps, to Dwight Eisenhower, because after all, he's one of the key individuals who enabled the monument section to do what they did. He did so exactly two weeks before D-Day, knowing very well the challenges and this race against time in order to save these cultural treasures. Uh, and so uh, Eisenhower himself later became a painter. He was certainly an appreciator of artwork. Uh, and so perhaps the movie's a little bit unfair to him in the little cameo that he has in this movie. Some of the painting that were stolen by the Germans are still not, are, are still missing. And an example, a famous one is uh, the portrait of a young man by Raphael. Maybe it's Raphael, we don't know. And so today, uh, there are still, I don't know, maybe millions or thousands uh, paintings um, are still missing. And, but uh, I would that in the last decades, the monuments, men and women, found nearly 30 of them and gave, gave them to, to their rightful owners back. Yeah, but like you said, Raphael's portrait of a young man is one that is still missing today. Yeah, maybe the most famous one. Yeah. Uh, so check those attics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> be culturally aware of these things that are missing uh, because you never know where they may turn up. And as a really good example of that, uh, as, the, as of the time that we're filming this, uh, just a, a few months ago, 
uh, a woman in Texas found the head of a Roman bust that is several thousands of years old. At a, she bought it at a Texas Goodwill for $35, um, and it's perhaps worth hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Um, and this was probably brought home by an American GI who was doing some souvenir hunting himself uh, during the Second World War. Uh, and so it, that just underscores the point. You never know where or when this stuff is going to show up. So to be culturally aware of these things is a really important step in the process. If it's true, because you know that Germans have orders to destroy them. So maybe these beautiful paintings are destroyed. Okay, well, what say you uh, fellas head to the exit? I think we're just gonna hang around and keep you company. It's not necessary, Frank. So, in places like the Merker salt mine, there was considerable fear about landmines, booby traps, improvised explosive devices, as we call them today, uh, lurking in the shadows, and so that never culminated in any real danger for the Monuments Men, but that, that lingering thought or that lingering dread or fear was very much present. And so in the film, they're playing with that. And it also leads to a little bit of trench comic relief, I think we could call it. And uh, it, it also permits this, this moment where the characters, who are sometimes at odds with one another, don't always get along, are able to profess their commitment to one another. And so it's this raw, raw moment of brotherhood and solidarity as they continue on their noble quest. And, you know, who can blame them? It's from teeth. I really like this shot of them going up the elevator because they're really shocked by what they have found barrels of gold teeth plucked from the mouths of the victims of the Holocaust and of course the Monuments Men and other Allied soldiers they not only found barrels of gold teeth but jewelry, eyeglasses, anything of value and this is how Nazi Germany was going to help pay for the rest of their war as they hope to continue fighting it and so it's a really sad and grim reminder of what was going on here. One of the major places that the monument men found a lot of artifacts about uh, arts, paintings, uh, artworks, was the Neustrenstein castle. Uh, it's in Neustria, just near the border. In Br yeah and into this they found um, major uh, artifacts that is well known in my region in north of france and it's the could you tell, just give you a shot about it yeah i mean this was a huge castle and it was owned by a baron who was called ludwig the mad because he kept uh, building on to it one of the the more interesting parts of all this is that this castle was the inspiration for Walt Disney's Disney Castle at Disneyland. Uh, and so he took a lot of the aesthetics from this castle. And in the book, uh, Robert Edsel has this to say about this site. The castle of Neuschwanstein was the key Nazi repository for the greatest works of stolen art from France. Built by Mad Ludwig of Bavaria in the 19th century, it contained so many stolen works of art that it took the monuments men six weeks to empty it. The extreme vertical height and absence of elevators required most of the work to be carried down the innumerable flights of stairs. So one of the things that I think the, the film fumbles around a bit with is that you know, as Theo mentioned earlier, there were 350 to 400 monuments, men and women, who were working in these endeavors. But in this movie, you only get the sense that it's these six or seven individuals who are going around and doing all of this work. There's no way that only six or seven GIs 
could be moving all of this stuff on their own. Uh, and so I, I think that's one area where the movie makes some pretty big historical errors uh, because you really don't get a sense of this big infrastructure or this institution that is allowing them to recover a whole lot of these things. That's a Rodin. Uh, so Matt Damon's character here uh, encounters a Rodin statue, um, and it's a real statue, and it's called the Burgers of Calais. And there's somewhat of a comical story behind the real-life discovery of all of this. Uh, one of the Monuments men who had gone out solo had disembarked from his Jeep, and he was walking on foot, and he was moving toward where he assumed a vast repository of, of art was being stored. And he's in the brush and he sees these men standing in the distance. And it looks like all of the men are arguing with one another. And the monuments man became so frustrated because he couldn't figure out why these men weren't moving. And then he, after a few seconds, he realized that he was actually looking at a statue and he wasn't looking at, you know, Germans who were out in the woods. And that is how the Burgers of Calais was discovered in actuality. I'd like to ask you a few questions. So why is you? Why'd you blow the mine? So with the Nero decree, many Germans at a local or regional level refused to obey that command because in a way they would also be demolishing their own heritage and their own identity. Uh, Albert Speer, for instance, Hitler's key architect, uh, he refused or overrode the orders that would have destroyed many of the bridges in Berlin because he realized that even in the wake of defeat, Berlin was still going to need its bridges. Uh, and so you see that happening at a smaller level at places like these mines where the art is purportedly being stored. And what, what happened in the mine depicted here in some of the final moments of the movie is that uh, you know, this hardcore Nazi officer that George Clooney is conversing with, um, he intended to demolish all of the different entryways to the different branches of the tunnels within this structure. And some of his subordinates, they only demolish the main opening. And so after you get through that main opening, you're able to have access to the rest of the mine. And so uh, whether or not the Allies could have access to the art completely depended on how obedient certain German officers were at key specific locations throughout the country as the Third Reich was collapsing. I was told that before you were sent here, you ran one of those camps. Who told you that? A little bird. So all of us know about the Nuremberg trial, like the condemnation of the German Nazi officers about the war crimes of the Holocaust, the concentration camps. Um, but you may know that uh, at the Nuremberg trials, there were some officers who, who stole arts who were judged to so the Nuremberg trial is not a, about Holocaust major fact it's about Holocaust but maybe uh, a bit too about arts and the movie depicted that. that's quite well too yeah and I think you raise a really good point in saying that because um, later on at Nuremberg certain prosecutors were saying, oh, you stole this art. And that was kind of a contributing factor to demonstrate Nazi villainy. Uh, and so in addition to these German officers being tried for these crimes against humanity, prosecutors were using examples of this stolen artwork as an indicator of just how low they were willing to go to deprive Jewish residents and citizens and the other people of Europe of their property, their livelihood, and their very identity. And so um, the work of the Monuments Men comes up in a very important legal and judicial venue in the years after the war as well. Maybe I should do this. What do you know about explosives? Nothing. 
Okay. With, uh, with the Monuments Men blowing the mine entrance here, at first I was a bit critical of that because I thought, why would they be doing that? They're a bunch of art professors. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be using dynamite or explosives or anything like that. Um, but as it, as it turns out, in one of the interviews that we were looking at as we were researching this movie, several of the Monuments Men were qualified demolition experts and how to dispose of explosives. And so it is not out of the realm of possibility at all that these men would have been using this, this equipment as such. And as the film depicts, uh, both the Ghent altarpiece and the Madonna with child were found in the Altarse mine and returned to their proper homes. And uh, it's a, a wonderful sort of climactic moment here where, you know, they're, they're down to the wire and uh, it's the last minute and the Russians are coming. Uh, and there's this, this final discovery and this epiphany. It wasn't quite as dramatic as this. Um, it wasn't as quite as uh, time sensitive, but uh, man, it's a great moment in the movie. I can't blame the filmmakers at all for casting it in the way that they did. We did leave something for our Russian friends to take back to Leningrad. Uh, a movie that our good friend Chuck reminded me of was another uh, black and white thriller from the 1960s, uh, a movie which stars Burt Lancaster, which is called The Train. Uh, and it's loosely based on some of these exploits where Nazis are trying to get some of these prized treasures uh, you know, into Germany as uh, the liberation of France is occurring. And there's a French railroad conductor or engineer played by Lancaster who is uh, hot on their trail. And uh, it is a really, really good action film. Uh, from the 1960s, uh, loosely based on some of these exploits associated with Rose Vallon. There are still, of course, many great works that have gone missing. Raphael's portrait of a young man, for instance, and with your permission, I'd like to keep looking for. Uh, the last scene is George Stolt uh, speaking like, yeah, uh, in maybe two years, we have found nearly five millions of stolen arts, paintings, uh, artifacts, and yes, without monuments, man, we can ask ourselves what will be us today without them. Mm. And yeah, I'm I'm French and I'm thankful to them. Mm. Yeah, that's that's well said. Um, and five million pieces of artwork is an incredible thing. Uh, but as the near end of the film here suggests, as uh, George Clooney's character is giving a, a briefing to President Truman. Uh, there's still work left to be done in this regard. Yeah. And here at the very end of the movie where we see an old Frank Stokes mm -hmm. here uh, beneath the Madonna and Shaw, that is actually George Clooney's dad who yeah. looks a lot like him. And I've actually met Nick Clooney. Um, and Nick Clooney used to be the host on AMC when they still showed classic films. Uh, and so I saw him a lot on television when I was a kid being the classic film junkie that I was and still am. So uh, a great little tribute here at the end of the movie that George Clooney pays to his dad. Kind of another throwback too is uh, here at the end titles, the music that's playing. It, it sounds a lot like the music off of Bridge on the River Kwai. Uh, so, you know, kind of another tip of the hat to the older generation of, of war films from the 1950s and the 1960s, which once again, is something I think was completely over the head of a lot of critics who uh, didn't care for this film. So Theo, what are your final thoughts on this film? What does it do well? Why do you appreciate mm. it? It's one of my favorite film because I love history, uh, World War II, and art too. So, so seeing a movie, well, these things are 
connected is for me a good pleasure uh, it's a it's a good film I, I can I can say it uh, uniforms are good uh, story too you can find some 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 inaccurate thing but like in every m film you can find about World War Two, but I will see you again with a good pleasure. I think. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. and like you said, it's it's easy to overlook some of the historical flaws in it because it raises awareness about a story that most people did not know about before <laughs> this the, this the movie film, yeah. came out, uh, and I think that's always a good thing. And even though it maybe oversimplifies a lot of the complexities of the Monuments Men and Women, uh, I think it, it gets to the kind of the core truth of what this entity was all about, and that is saving art and culture for posterity. And as the film finally suggests here at the very end, uh, this is a task that continues forward to this very day. Decades onward, this art is still missing, uh, European families are still deprived of things that they should have inherited. Uh, walls in museums are still empty uh, because the art is still missing. Uh, and everybody can do their part to an extent. And as I said earlier, the best thing that we can do is just be aware of these things. And in order to be aware of these different things, uh, I encourage you to visit the website of the Monuments Men and Women Foundation. You can go ahead and Google that. It has a lot of not only educational resources listed on that website, but it also has some images, descriptions, and clues about some of those masterworks that are still missing to this very day. And so we encourage you to check out that website and you can find the link for that below in our caption. So, as always, we like to recommend a little bit of additional reading and homework, and Theo has our first one. Yeah, I think you've seen this one a lot of uh, times during the movie, but yeah, you may have this one on your own. Your... Yep, it's a fantastic yeah. book by Robert Edsel, who is a philanthropist, a historian, and he's really the one who has spearheaded a lot of these efforts to reclaim that missing art. And so thorough was his research that he was not able to compile it all in a single book. There is a sequel to The Monuments Men, which is called Saving Italy. And the, sub and the caption for it is, The Race to Rescue a Nation's Treasure from the Nazis. So The Monuments Men looks primarily at these journeys in France and Germany, uh, this one goes a little bit further. It heads to the Mediterranean, and you meet a whole other additional cast of characters who are doing similar work to the ones that we see about in The Monuments Men, both the book and the movie. And we also have a documentary that I would like to suggest. Um, this one is called The Rape of Europa, uh, and this one is a very in-depth documentary that chronicles how and why the Nazis perceived and valued certain types of artwork, why they denigrated other forms of artwork, and how that all culminates in this quest by Allied service members at the end of the Second World War to try to retrieve it. Uh, and so if you're looking for another film, in addition to the likes of The Train or Is Paris Burning, uh, the documentary The Rape of Europa is incredibly insightful. One of the things that Theo does in order to preserve memories of the Second World War, he has particular interest in the history of the U.S. 4th Infantry Division, uh, the division that my grandfather fought in during the Second World War. That's how we all kind of became interconnected. Uh, and so uh, one thing that he would like to do, um, if any of you know any World War II veterans of the 4th Infantry Division, uh, we welcome you to reach out to us at our email below in the description. Uh, and put us in touch with them because we would love to interview those individuals and Theo would love to yeah. uh, have that information yeah. in his archives. Help us to preserve their memories. This is very important for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. That wraps up this episode of Real History and we'd once again like to give a special thank you to our friend Theo who has joined us from France and has offered some really valuable international and personal perspective. So Theo, thank you for joining us thank on Real you. History. Thank you, Joanna. All right. We'll see you next time.